Welcome to That's Good Sports, I'm Brandon. I tore my ACL 13 years ago, and I'm still recovering Perna. If my ACL was fully healed, why would I still need to take Percocets with Vicodin chasers every morning and evening? No other explanation. Which is why after eight short months, it's insane to think Chargers tight end Hunter Henry could play this weekend. If he does, we all owe Stephen A. Smith a huge apology and should actually credit him for being the first to scoop the story. Thinking about Hunter Henry and the way that he's played this year is a <laughs> Today I'm gonna to break down the Chargers versus Ravens and the Bears versus Eagles and dive into all the things the NFL Network doesn't have the greasy cojones to talk about. That's good, sports. Please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel only if you think I'm worthy. If you don't, what can I, what can I do? That wasn't rhetorical. Literally, tell me what I can do. Before I give you my ill-informed seventh grade reading level thoughts on these games, let me bring in the almighty urinating tree to give his thoughts on the Chargers Ravens game. The Chargers and Ravens locking horns in battle leaves a few wrinkles. Baltimore turning into Pinocchio and growing up to become a real offense. The Diamond Dogs experiencing their wonderful San Diego luck by losing out on home field. And a ridiculous amount of Yenzer salt in Pittsburgh. Ooh, the stuff on my shoulder, that's just standard. I have a feeling this game holds a lot of balance in the AFC. Both of these teams have a chance to go far. The Ravens' rushing attack is a relentless surge rush hell-bent on destroying your home base. The Chargers, while not exactly the greatest historical performers in the clutch, have been warriors on the road, rattling off impressive wins in both Pittsburgh and Kansas City. Now we will see which defense is truly worthy of the hyphened praise. This is going to be a tight battle. Even as the Ravens crushed them in week 16, the playoffs are a new beast. My pick? Teams have had a really hard time stopping Baltimore's ground game as of late, so I'm going to give them the edge to win. Congratulations on the Chargers advancing to the next round. Why wasn't I born with a voice like that, Mom? Hmm? If you love eloquently written, shit-talking sports videos, make sure you check out Urinating Tree's YouTube channel. Now, this is the first playoff game the Chargers have played in in five years. It is the first in four years for the Ravens. And if it were any other quarterback than Phillip Rivers, I'd call this the born again virgin showdown. But using the word virgin and Phillip Rivers in the same sentence is like using the term intellectual and Gronkowski in the same sentence. I don't think you could have found two more opposite quarterbacks than Phillip Rivers and Lamar Jackson. Between the two of them, they average a 4.71 in the 40-yard dash. They've combined for 380 touchdown passes. Uh, when you average out Rivers' seven rushing yards in 2018 with Jackson's 695, they average 351 between them, and they average four and a half offspring apiece. It's basically the most prolific quarterback matchup you're going to see this weekend. Another thing to keep in mind is it's going to be a frigid, Fit 52 degrees in Baltimore. Shit, I, I expected it to be colder than that on Sunday. Uh, I guess the weather, stupid weather take won't work like a condom in a Rivers household. What do each of these teams need to do to win? It seems obvious, uh, but for the Chargers, I would recommend not starting the game with an interception and not ending the game with an interception and praying the usually sure-handed Antonio Gates doesn't have an untimely fumble late in the fourth quarter that Tavon Young returns for a touchdown. Aside from that, LA has to exploit Baltimore's biggest weakness, which seems pretty obvious. Lamar Jackson throwing the football. I don't recommend doing what the Steelers did against Tim Tebow and playing cover zero the whole game because Jackson can hit guys deep like he did to Mark Andrews in the first game. The Chargers need to get an early lead and minimize the ability of the Ravens to run the ball. If they can get up by 10 points in this game, the Ravens aren't built to win that kind of game coming from behind. And I bet you think I'm going to make a joke about Phillip Rivers not coming from behind either, because I've done it before. You are wrong. Getting up early, getting a lead early, also takes the crowd out of the game. But that might not matter to a team that's essentially played 16 road games all year. Uh, that might be their bag, like Swedish penis pumps in Austin Powers' bag. 
Yes, it, it does take a lot of effort and analytical research here at That's Good Sports Studios to come across an Austin Powers reference. I saw a stat that said Lamar Jackson set the record for most rushing attempts in a season by a quarterback. I didn't double check it, but it sounds true. And crazy since he only started seven games this season. With 147 rushing attempts, he ran the ball more than Isaiah Crowell, Mark Ingram, and Dalvin Cook. I feel like the greatest bait and switch would be for the Ravens offensive coordinator, Marty Morningweg, to have Jackson throw the ball 50 plus times in this game. The Chargers would not see that coming. Lamar Jackson will still be 21 years old when he plays in this game, making him the youngest QB in NFL history to start a playoff game. When I was 21, I became the oldest adult living with my grandparents instead of uh, a bunch of other dudes in a house on a college campus. So I know exactly how Lamar Jackson is feeling heading into this game. Jackson, also the only QB drafted in the first round to start in a playoff game from this last draft, because all those other quarterbacks had to go play for shitty teams. Jackson will turn 22 on Monday, and if Phillip Rivers gives him a birthday gift that is a loss, that makes Rivers basically the worst dad in the, the NFL. When Rivers was 21, he of course had already fathered four kids and had an investment portfolio so impressive, he almost made a guest appearance in the movie Wolf of Wall Street. For the Ravens, it's pretty simple. Do the same things that won you the first game. Win the turnover battle, which they won three to one, get in Phillip Rivers' face. They sacked him four times for a combined 34 yards lost. Uh, that's a big reason Rivers' play has declined recently. The Chargers' offensive line has been exposed, and the Ravens have a huge advantage up front. The Chargers defensively don't have a dominant defensive line, and the pass rush ability of Bosa and Ingram gets negated if the team they play never passes the fucking ball. The Ravens run the ball, and they do it well with the 70s rock trio of Jackson, Edwards, and Dixon a soulful group that worked with Neil Young from time to time. The Chargers will need their solo Motown slash blues artist, Barry Movin' Melvin Bleedin' Gums Gordon, to keep the Ravens from running out the clock. Gordon is supposedly healthy and ready to rock and roll. If it becomes any kind of shootout, the Chargers are much better equipped to win. As a Chargers fan, whoever you are, your biggest concern has to be Phillip Rivers and his interceptions. He doubled his season total from 6 to 12 over the last three games. Two picks in each and a QB rating never above 89. And he had had a QB rating of over 100 pr pretty much every week this season. Basically, since he announced they're expecting a ninth child in the Rivers family, his play has drastically declined. I'd like to thank everyone for sticking with That's Good Sports and its endless supply of Philip Rivers mentions about how many kids he has and how he is the greatest threat to the human race's future by overpopulating the world. And this could be the Chargers' last game, so I really needed to cram as many references in this episode as possible. Now, moving on to the I'm this big Nick Foles versus I love kissing titties Trubisky matchup. This game is sex. Two great football cities collide in an orgy of blue, green, and orange, which I haven't witnessed since spending two years studying the mating habits of the orange-hooded Goldian Finch in the grassy tropics of Australia. Orange-hooded is also what you'd get if Donald Trump and Bill Belichick ever made it. The big story in Philly is the impending decision between Nick Foles and Carson Wentz. I thought at first this was a unique situation, but then I remembered that there have actually been quite a few times that teams have had to make a tough decision at quarterback. Probably the most famous one was Tom Brady and Drew Bledsoe. Clearly the Patriots made the wrong decision there, but the Pats opted for the younger, less likable player who would grow up into a man who loves Frenching children. Then you had Drew Brees and Phillip Rivers, two quarterbacks that could potentially face each other in this Super Bowl. San Diego went with the younger Rivers, Colin Kaepernick and Alex Smith, again, the younger one. Carson Wentz is only three and a half years younger than Big Dong Nick. So the age disparity really makes this an interesting case uh, for the Eagles. The Chicago Bears, if they obliterate the Eagles Sunday, will make that decision a lot easier for the Philly front office this offseason. But if Nick Foles wins another Super Bowl, I don't know what the hell you do there. 
How do you not keep the guy who won you two Super Bowls? In terms of this game though, Doug Peterson and Matt Nagy, both very innovative play callers, not afraid to take risks or call for trick plays. Literally the only play that would surprise me in this game is if Nick Foles somehow threw a touchdown pass to Mitch Trubisky. The reason the Bears are in the playoffs though is because they have an insanely opportunistic defense, which is a big reason I hope the Denver Broncos hire their defensive coordinator, Vic Fangio. Bears edge rusher Khalil Mack describes him as an evil genius. Aaron Lynch says he's a mob boss. He's the Godfather all the way. Uh, spoiler alert, the Godfather dies in the first movie. You don't want your defense dying in the first round of the playoffs. But also hope you make it to the, the third game, as long as it's not also like the third Godfather. It's a bad reference, man. Honestly, the last defense this talented to be in the playoffs was the 2015 Denver Broncos. That is why, even with the up and down play from Mitch Trubisky, I believe the Bears can win the Super Bowl this season. In 2015, the Denver Broncos had 52 sacks on the season. Chicago has 50 this year. The Bears and Broncos each had one safety on the season. Denver, five defensive touchdowns. Chicago, six defensive touchdowns. Chicago, 19 forced fumbles. Broncos, 25 forced fumbles. Denver gave up 18.5 points per game. Chicago, 17.7 .7 points per game. The big difference being the Bears have 27 picks this season and Denver only had 14 their Super Bowl defensive season. Also in Chicago's favor is that linebacker Danny Trevathan was on the 2015 Broncos defense and Denver won the Super Bowl with a dominant defensive team the season after firing John Fox, just like the Bears. If you don't win the Super Bowl, Chicago, there's something wrong with you. There are so many playmakers on the Bears defense and the Eagles defensive line. I'm not going to break down all of, all of these guys. <laughs> That's too much work. The difference is Chicago has a much better secondary. All this game really comes down to is whether or not Nick Foles has enough magic hidden in his deep dish sized wangus to score points on the Bears defense. Offensively, these teams are similar. I mean, the Bears signed former Eagles tight end Trey Burton this offseason, which turned out to be a smart move. Both teams have good offensive lines, multiple running back rotations. Uh, good, but not great wide receivers. But to me, Jeffrey and Allen Robinson, very similar. Philly actually may have a better wide receiving crew with Golden Tate in the mix, but I think Chicago's secondary neutralizes that. Basically, I don't want to think too much about this game because I think it's going to be awesome. I trust Nick Foles in a big game more than Mitch Trubisky at this point. But I also trust the Bears defense to make the afternoon hell for Foles. So, even though part of me really, really wants to jump back on the Foles poll, and trust me, there's plenty of room up there, I can't bet against a truly elite defense. I think the Bears have that. I think the Bears win in a beautifully ugly game to finish the wildcard weekend. And those are your picks. Big thanks to Urinating Tree for helping in this video. Make sure you subscribe here, share this video on all of the social medias. If somebody hits you up on Tinder or Bumble, just share them one of my videos. I think that might help get you a date. At WillKeys6, a follow on Twitter. He helps me write these bad boys. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, at Brandon Perna.